decided to do then is to have a bit of a dialogue between our, our speakers today and with Alex and, and, uh, and then to open this up and uh, for, for, for questions that you might have or short, uh, short comments, not polemics or things like that, not speeches, there'll be time for that later. And um, so uh, I, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to ask, one of the things that I get confronted with uh, when I talk about climate change is um, uh, policymakers or managers saying uncertainty. We need, to, we need more, you know, we, we need to have some balance on the uncertainty. And, uh, and we, we need to know what, what, the, what the, the levels that we might expect are. We, you know, maybe a mean, an ensemble mean, is not going to be useful for them. And so I would wonder if we have Alex up here and we have our three uh, esteemed uh, uh, panelists, if they might ask Alex about the number one uncertainty that they would face in terms of making a prescription for the county, for the city, for our state, in terms of planning right now and spending real money on climate change. What's the biggest uncertainty in the spheres in which you work that you would have with Alex's data uh, in terms of then actually putting money on the line to do something right now? Well, I actually uh, wouldn't focus on the uncertainty in Alex's data. I think he represented that really well. I think the one of the political uncertainties that we want to address is what's in it for the average household. How, how, how can their lives be improved? How can their monthly expenditures be reduced? And so translating the really remarkable opportunity we have financially coming down the pike over the next one to four years to make these investments in an intelligent way um, and translate that into cost savings for the average disadvantaged household member. That would be, that's what needs to be clarified now, especially, and, and I, I don't want to get polemical, but we have the governor borrowing from our auction revenues right now, $500 million, and one of the reasons that that's been possible is because households and local leaders never really understood what was in it for them. That we could do both good by reducing GHG emissions, and we could uh, make our local disadvantaged communities more economically and environmentally resilient. So that message didn't get through up to this point. Jonathan, you agree everything, what Alex told you, that's the way it's going to be in 2050. You're ready to write, sign a check over now? I, I think one of the greatest uh, uncertainties is, uh, candidly, it's the, the public and the public response. Uh, they provide the direction to policymakers. I, I find that the public leads and the policymakers oftentimes follow. And it's my feeling that the environmental community, we have not done a sufficient job in uh, talking with the public about their own stake in this. Uh, we haven't uh, really said the word adaptation is necessary. There used to be this this uh, meme out there that if you talk about adaptation, it's saying it's okay to build a bomb shelter and you're not trying to stop the bombs. But what you heard from Alex is that that metaphor doesn't hold up, that we have to adapt, that even the mitigation scenario shows significant impacts in Southern California. And so what if instead of driving people to say that there has to be a uh, a reduction in GHG, what if instead we led the conversation by saying, we have to get ready for climate change and here are the impacts. And you lead them through the financial case of what we have to do to meet the challenge locally. The infrastructure that we have to spend and the, the literally the billions of dollars to just maintain the status quo. The question will arise very, very quickly. Like, isn't there a way of going upstream and kind of like stemming some of these problems? Isn't there a way of curtailing it? Isn't there a way of reducing the impacts? And we walk people through that argument so that they come to the conclusion. They arrive at the place that mitigation is absolutely the best place that we have to be, rather than trying to jam mitigation down their throats right now. That message only works in a relative amount, and what we need is vast adoption of the public uh, to really get behind a mitigation scenario. But it's my view that we have to lead with climate impacts to lead them to those conclusions. It's funny, so we're all on the same page. The reason I didn't want to be the first to answer this question is, I guess I was going to say the same thing, which is I, I 
reject the premise of the question in a way. I don't think there's any plausible interpretation of the conversation happening around climate and the nation today that says we need less scientific <laughs> uncertainty and then the problem would go away. Right? It's really that we need new political breakthroughs. And the conversation about how to get those political breakthroughs is the one that's key to have. And I agree with both of my fellow panelists about how to do that. I, I, with all respect to my panelists, you're at 30,000 feet. I deal with people who are running dams and things like that. And basically, none of you ask the right questions. Let me put one of the questions to you. <laughs> this has to do with precipitation. Right now, Lake Powell and Lake Mead are he heading towards less than 50% capacity. We're heading towards a level one water scarcity declaration. That would automatically put into place then cuts of water transference to Arizona and to Nevada. Do you think there'll be litigation? Absolutely. Right now at the federal level then, they're trying to get together a, uh, some kind of a compromise to deal with this. One of the biggest uncertainties that is faced in the climate models is precipitation. And I would like Alex to talk a little bit about where that is right now, where that might be going, and how that might be solved. And I think that that's the kind of uncertainty I'm talking about. If you're going to decide for the next 50 years how to run the Colorado River, I think you, there are uncertainties in the models that, that, that we presently have. I wonder if, if uh, um, Alex might comment on where that arises and how it might be addressed. Well, yeah. the. Um... <clears throat> There, there, there is this. There is a very large uncertainty, especially with 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 how weather change in the Southwest broadly, and um, and that that arises because you know south of, of this 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 part of the world, there's there's pretty pretty robust drying in these climate simulations. North of this this area, there's there's moistening, um, and and that's pretty robust. But in between, it's not clear what happens, and. Um, and, and that's why you know the envelope of, of precipitation change is, is pretty wide in the Southwest generally. Um, and then there are uncertainties associated with the, with the future behavior of the El Nino phenomenon, which affects precipitation in this region. Um, so that's a that's a tough one. And then I think the other thing is I don't think the climate community has fully um, has done a holistic approach to water resources. We've looked at looked at precipitation, evaporation, soil moisture, stream flow holistically. Um, and, and I think, I mean, there's been some of that, of course, and some, some very good work, but, but um, that has to be kind of the end goal, end-to-end -end water resource um, understanding. And so that, that's, I think, um, yeah, a, a, a very important um, very important issue, of course, and, and there needs to be a lot of work on that. Um, so, but, you know, I also think that um, the, the I, I, I originally thought that building in uncertainty estimates would, would be a way to dialogue with, with people who are resistant to climate change conversations. Um, you know, because it, it, it allows them to, it, it puts it in terms of, of um, you know, how much risk they're willing, willing to tolerate and what they believe about, about these models. Um, you know, c conservative people are supposed to be risk averse. But you know, if the, 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 the models that, that um, you know, that, that but the, the models that give the least amount of change, I guess, would be the ones that they would believe in. But that's that's a very unlikely outcome. So you, it, it kind of puts it, it puts the skepticism in more rational terms and allows people to talk about it in those terms. But I don't know if that's so important for this audience or for this conversation. But I was thinking that it might be helpful um, generally to have have an uncertainty built into the data so that people could talk about it in terms of risk. Yeah. 